for leading us in those songs. Your presence here this evening indicates your interest in spiritual things and could be doing other things, and you chose to be here this evening to study God's Word and committed for that. I commend you for that. I commend you for your interest in spiritual uh, things and your support of this gospel meeting effort that the church is doing here. Where are we going to devote some time to a little more intense study on some things in our Subject, of course, as we've been talking about, is reverence and godly fear. Uh, I want to express my deep thanksgiving uh, for Tyler doing work on the website, and I know he's had others who have helped him as well. I believe Ethan has uh, uploaded a lot of different sermons, and uh, Nick and John and others are contributed, I'm sure, in different ways. And I just want to express my thanksgiving for that. It's a tool that is so needed in this day in which we live and uh, really want to encourage each member <clears throat> to uh, establish an account there because it will help us uh, to stay close uh, to one another and it will help us to convey information to one another, encourage one another, uh, that website will. So uh, search that out and I believe an invitation is sent to your email address. Uh, take advantage of that and create an account and log in and let's use that as we go forward with the work here. It is a joy to be with you this evening, and it's humbling to talk about God and His greatness, and that's what we've been talking about on Sunday. Uh, the basis for the reverence of godly fear is the greatness of God and at the other end of the spectrum, the lowliness of man. And then on Sunday evening, we talked about our uh, being given to pause, to restrain ourselves, and the majesty of God should become a bridle uh, upon our actions to where uh, we think before we speak, we think before we do, and seek to give glory unto Him. This evening, of course, we're going to be looking at sustaining a sense of fear as we talk about reverence and godly fear. In Hebrews chapter 12, our springboard text for this meeting is verse 28 and 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace, by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. I'd encourage you to open your Old Testament, the book of, Acts, or book of Exodus, chapter 19. In Exodus uh, chapter 19, because as I've mentioned throughout this meeting, that throughout these lessons uh, frequently, is that uh, the, the message in the book of Hebrews, particularly there in chapter 12 and other places as well, has within the backdrop this Levitical religion, this Levitical priesthood, this Levitical sacrifice, this Levitical worship, where the reverence is there. And uh, of course, we know we're not under that system today, but the quality of reverence is something that is uh, bound and incorporated into the New Testament church. And this evening, uh, we're going to uh, address uh, the subject of maintaining a, a, a face of humility before our God. And so over there in Exodus chapter 19, uh, begin reading with me in verses 16 through 22. <clears throat> it reads here, it came to pass on the third day in the morning, there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud and a mountain and a sound <clears throat> and the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it. I just want you to pause there and think for a moment. As majestic as this scene is, I want you to think about what it will be like when Jesus descends in the second coming. He's not going to come to give a law. He's going to come to judge. And it won't be one mountain that's quaking and filled with smoke. In fact, we know that the heavens and the earth, which currently exist, are going to melt with fervent heat. The majesty of that day is beyond comprehension. I stand amazed in the song that was just saying. That sentiment comes to my mind. Here, its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. In verse 19, the blast of the trumpet sounded and became louder and louder. Think of it in Thessalonians where we hear it when we know when the last trumpet sounds. 
No one's playing a trumpet here. No mortal's playing a trumpet. That's just the sound that's coming out. God's making that sound here in Exodus chapter 19. He's going to make that sound when he comes again. And I, I, I have a suspicion that the trumpet that will sound when he comes again is going to be more glorious than the trumpet here. Okay? It's going to, start, it's going to you know, vibrate throughout the entire universe, uh, for sure the globe. And here we have Moses uh, spoke and God answered him by voice. Uh, what an honor that would be. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. You know, God comes down to the top of the mountain because he's beyond the mountains, right? He's higher than the mountains. And he, he can only come down <laughs> on our highest place. He would have to come down. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain. And Moses went up. What did he say? Moses, come here. What does Moses do? He goes up. As soon as he goes up, notice verse 21. The Lord said to Moses, go down. You like to do mountain climbing? Think of that, Jess, this summer. As soon as you go up that mountain, then think of the boy said, go back down, right? And then you're going to go back up again. <laughs> Moses was no doubt in shape, right? And the Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people, lest they break through to gaze at the Lord, and many of them perish. Now, it's, it's astounding to me that this warning comes again. This is a warning here in verse 21, and it just seems almost redundant. They've already been warned. I think Sam was reading earlier uh, from chapter 19 and may have hit on some of this uh, earlier on Sunday when he was reading from Exodus chapter 19, but they were already warned in, um, uh, up there er earlier in verse 10. Uh, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around saying, take heed to yourself that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain will surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned. It's like as soon as you touch it, there could be a stone coming right at you. It's just going to take you out. Or you'll be shot with an arrow. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. If you touch the mountain, if you break the boundary, there are bounds that are set around this mountain. Don't trespass. As soon as you trespass, anybody trespasses, they're going to be shot, they're going to be stoned, they're going to die. Well, that's what we're reading about in verse 21, go down and warn the people lest they break through the bounds that have been set around this mountain. If you trespass these, you're going to perish. And it really hints at, the, you know, because Moses has to go up and then come back down and tell the people, it really hints at just how stubborn these people are, just how rebellious they are. That's what it tells me as it radiates from the page that these people don't listen. They don't follow directions very well. And well, what are we today? We're kind of the same way. We don't follow directions uh, like we ought to. And, you know, there, there's a, a teaching here in Scripture that God doesn't want them to come and irreligiously gaze upon me. You look at me, you're going to die. I mean, that's the reverence that's there. And you look at the holy articles. Have, have you considered writing down Numbers chapter 4, verse 20? Numbers 4, verse 20. Kind of pencil it in there. Because irreligious zeal was, was punishable even for a priest. And so these Levites there in Numbers chapter 4 were going to work with the things that were prepared by, the, by Aaron's sons, but they weren't allowed to go in while these things were prepare, being prepared to just gaze upon them. That was wrong. Later on, years later, when Samuel was judging and the, and the judging kind of comes to an end, in 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 19, there were a lot of people from, I think it was Beth Shemesh, that looked into the Ark of the Covenant, that gazed into the Ark of the Covenant. Thousands of people died because they did that. So, reverence, godly fear, it just radiates from the text and the boundaries. As they were to mind those boundaries around the mountain, so we must mind the boundaries of Scripture. Let us not gaze beyond the boundaries. Let us not try to go beyond the boundaries. Let's be content with the boundaries, right? Serve God in reverence and godly fear. And so that brings us up to the point of tonight that we need to sustain a sense of fear and a sense of shame. And again, that's not popular today. This, this message wouldn't resonate with most of the people in the world because they don't want to be held in shame. Shame is a bad thing. We want to stay away from that. 
We don't want to feel sorrow. We don't want to be humble. We want to be proud. As a peacock, we want to strut like a rooster. We want to show our colors, right? It's all about us. It's not about God. And so that's the way people are. Well, this word, and as I mentioned already, this word in Hebrews 12, 28, translated reverence, in the New King James, I stress that for a reason. If you want me to explain that later to you, why I stress in the New King James, I'll explain that later if you're curious. But I don't want to get into it now. But it's the same word that's in the King James, and I'm stressing that (laughs) for a reason. New American Standard, American Standard need not apply, okay? This is the King James, New King James word. That word from the King James is translated shame faced. Okay, shamefacedness. The American standard has shamefastness. Okay, and that's good. It's a good translation as well. But I want you to appreciate there is a shameness here, a shame quality here, a bashful quality here that means to have a regard for others, a respect for others. Okay, and that's what's in that's what's in play here in this word. It's the word that's found in First Timothy two verse nine in the New King James. Okay? And in the King James, it's the same word uh, that, that, that's there in translated reverence in Hebrews 12. So, uh, you know, because of his majesty, because of his glory, because of his, his grand person, we need to approach him with trembling and with fear. If you, could, if you could move in your Bibles over to the fifth book, the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 9, and, you know, I've got so much material that I could literally, and I'm not speaking hyperbole here, I could go on for an hour and a half tonight. I really could. But I have to use some discretion. And I want to get through this in a timely manner. So follow along with me as, as, as well as you can. And Deuteronomy chapter 9, notice what uh, the Bible here is saying. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over to the Jordan today. So they're going to cross over the Jordan, come into the promised land today. And to go in and to dispossess nations greater and mightier than yourself, cities great and fortified up to heaven. These nations are bigger than you. They're better than you. Their their towers are great. And you're going to go in in there and you're going to dispossess. You're going to take control. You're going to own it. A people great and tall, the descendants of the Anakim, whom you know and whom you have heard said, who can stand before the descendants of Anak? Therefore, understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you so that you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord has said to you. Do not think in your heart after the Lord your God has cast them out before you, saying, because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out from before you. It is not because of your righteousness, verse 5. It's not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart. Underscore that. It's not because of the uprightness of your heart. It's not because of your righteousness. He's just hammering this point down. It's nothing inherent to you. You're going to go in there and take something that's not yours. God's going to destroy them, and he's going to give it to you, and it has nothing to do with your righteousness, and it has nothing to do with your righteousness, and it has nothing to do with your heart, the righteousness of your heart. I said that three times because that's what he's saying here, three times. He's like just hammering it, hammering it, hammering it. But because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God drives them out of the place from you, that he may fulfill the word with which he swore to your father, Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. Therefore, understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. He just hammers it over and over again. Did you hear me the first time? I want to say it again. Did you hear me the second time? I want to say it again. Did you hear me now? It's not because of your righteousness that you're going to, to take this. And that really just stands out of me that Moses... He knows that these people are so stiff-necked and rebellious that they just don't get it. you got to tell them three times, and maybe they're not going to get it then. He's just emphasizing, emphasizing, emphasizing. But as we step back and look at the text, what should we think? How should they then enter into the promised land? Knowing that it's not because of the righteousness of our conduct, it's not the righteousness of our conduct, it's not the righteousness of our conduct... (laughs) It's not the righteousness of our heart. How should we enter into the promised land? That's how you should enter into the promised land. With a sense of shame and unworthiness. 
You know, he goes on here in chapter 9. I love Moses. The book of Deuteronomy, very neglected. Book of sermons. He's preaching to them as they're getting ready to go cross over the Jordan. We sing the song, Jordan Stormy Banks, because we're kind of parallel here. We're ready to go into our promised land. And Moses is just teaching them over and over again about, you know, the, the, the blessedness of obedience and the wretchedness of sin. And he goes down through this chapter 9, and he's just reminding them of their provocation of the Lord God, how they provoked him throughout the wilderness and how they provoked him with the golden calf. And now God was dead set on destroying the entire nation and building Moses into a nation. He was even going to destroy Aaron, as I mentioned last night there, and, and, and uh, that's in verse 20. And in verse 19, Moses says, I was afraid of the anger of the hot displeasure of the Lord. Moses was actually in full dread over the hot displeasure of God. Yet he spoke to God, interceded for Israel. God listened to him. You're not going into the promised land because of your righteousness. You almost perish as a nation. Go into the land, how? With a sense of shame. You know, the point really comes to a helm as you keep going down through the text. Remember, these, chap these weren't broken up in chapters when Moses was writing them. So you, you keep reading chapter 10, that's all connected material. And then all of a sudden it reaches this high climax in chapter 10, verse 12. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? He's calling them to, a, that. you know, this is the point that I really want you to see. It's like Solomon saying, what is the conclusion of the whole matter? This is what Moses is saying here. I want you to get this point, he's saying. What does the Lord your God require of you but to what? The first thing he mentions here is what? Fear. Fear the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, to love him and to serve him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Does that sound familiar? Sounds very familiar. Kind of sounds like the first and great commandment that Jesus, right, gave, doesn't it? Yeah. And to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today, for your good. They're for your good. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord. No, don't just look at the things horizontally here. Look vertically in the heavens and the highest heaven, the heavens that are even out of your sight. That all belongs to your God. And then he says, the earth with all that's in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers. Again, he's emphasizing this. God delighted in Abraham. I'm giving you this land because of my delight in Abraham. God hasn't delighted in you. You've been a stiff-necked, rebellious, ungodly people to this day, and you were almost destroyed. And he chose their descendants after them that above all the peoples as it is this day. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be, be stiff-necked no longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods, Lord of lords, great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes bribes. What's he saying? What's the point? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is the point when you just put all of this together in a very concise way. Your disposition, your heart, as we started out there in chapter 9, verse 1 through 5 or 6, your heart that you had when you left Egypt needs to radically change when you enter into the promised land. The heart that you had in the Exodus had better change radically to a different heart to enter into this promised land. Because if you don't, God shows no partiality. And those nations that he uprooted and that he kicked out and let you take, he will also do the same to you. He will take you out. Tell me if I'm wrong on that. But I think that's the point. And it is sustaining, emphasizing, sustaining that fear, not becoming too big for our britches, so to speak, right? Sustaining that humility, that sense of shame, that's so vitally important. And I could probably just put an invitation on this right now, and that would be the lesson. But we need to make some applications, right? Someone might respond, wait. I don't like that shamefacedness. We live under the New Testament. I don't want that. I want boldness. Away with this fear. That's Old Testament. God's different then. Right? Like Martianism, you know, now God loves. <laughs> and so we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in Him. We don't have to have that fear. Where is this faith? Where is this boldness? 
Notice, in whom and in him. See the bookends of that verse? In whom, in him. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through what? Faith in him. It's the through faith in Christ that we have boldness. It's not in self. It's not in arrogance. It's not in me, myself, and I. But it's in Christ because every spiritual blessing is found in Christ, Ephesians 1, verse 3. Because God has called us in Him to be holy and without blame. Because in Him or in the Beloved, we are accepted. See, there's fear and humility at the same time, confidence, not inwardly, but confidently upwardly towards God. Because through in Him, in Christ, we have redemption through His blood there. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. And so in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. What did Jesus save us from? You just think about that question. And what's the answer in that verse? What did Jesus save us from? He saved us from our sins, right? Verse 7, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. <clears throat> what an awful cost through His blood. This salvation in verse 7 is not a license to sin because we know in chapter 5, verse, uh, many verses in Ephesians, but chapter 5, verse 3, talks about what is not fitting for the saints. You know, fornication and uncleanness and covetousness. Anything, you know, all that uncleanness is, is not fitting for the saints. So this is not, this boldness that we have is not a license to sin. Because we know that the blood of God, the blood of Christ, the Son of God, was shed so that we could be justified, much more having now been justified by His blood. Paul says, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Redemption through His blood, Ephesians 1, 7 but, and we're saved, he's, he's, he's forgiven our sins, verse 7, but Romans 5, verse 9, teaches us that we shall be saved from what? The Bible says, saved from wrath. Saved from wrath. Well, I want you to think about that. Saved from sin, saved from wrath. These are, inter, inter, these are connected. Romans chapter 4, verse 15, because the law brings about wrath. What? The law brings about wrath. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. So it's explaining how the law brings about wrath, incidentally, because where there is no law, there is no transgression. So where there is law, there is transgression. So what is it that really brings about wrath is transgression. When we transgress law, we invite the wrath of God. And it is through the law that we grow accustomed to understand what is right and wrong and are accountable, right? So when we choose to violate, just like our parents, you know, when, when, when they get, lay down the law and they say, this is what it shall be, and the next day they have to tell us again, this is what it shall be, they're not going to be too happy when they have to tell us again. Or if we violate that. I know you said this is what it shall be, and I think it shall not be, right? And so it's a power of will. It's a contest of will, right? Parental will versus the child's will. Well, that's going to invoke the wrath of parents. The same way here, this invokes the wrath of God. Now, there's nothing within the law here to fix this transgression. So... The law points out sin. The sin that we committed is worthy of God's, it invokes his wrath. In 1 John 3, verse 3, we have two groups of people. The first group in verse 3, the second in verse 4. And everyone who has this hope in himself purifies himself just as he is pure. That hope is conditioned on verse 2 or connected to verse 2 where we want to see uh, you know, God as, as he is when he comes. We want to see him as he is. And through that hope, we purify ourselves. We strive to live in a way that is pure just as He is pure, right? So it has a motivation effect to become pure like Jesus is pure. But here's the other group. 
everyone versus whoever. They're kind of the same group, the same language here. Everyone who does this works to be pure. Likewise, everyone or whoever commits or does sin also commits lawlessness. And what is sin? Sin is lawlessness. Sin is a violation of law. All sin is lawlessness, and all lawlessness is sin. And what does it bring? The wrath of God. Jesus didn't come to take away all law. So we're not under any law today. Yeah, we are. We're under law. Jesus came to take away our sins. Just go to the next verse, verse 5. Okay? There's law today. We're not under the law of Moses. I get that. The law against fornication and covetousness and lying and stealing, that's still there. That's, that's in the new covenant, right? Jesus came to take away our sins. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is transgression. He came to take that away. And in taking away our sins, he takes away that sacrifice takes away the dead, of course, but it takes away the wrath of God. And so that's why Paul is saying we should be saved from wrath to come. It's not a license to sin by any stretch of the imagination. If, if you just keep reading in Romans, you, you come to chapter 6 where Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we continue in sin? That's a question. Shall we continue in it? Why would Paul even ask that question? Well, Paul asked that question because he's anticipating an argument from what he said in verse 20 of chapter 5. Chapter 5, 20, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So where, you know, the law entered and what, what's abounding from the law? Violation, violation, violation. As you go out, there's all these sins. People are committing the sins now because the law is exposing what is wrong and what is right. So the sin abounds. Well, God... Paul is telling us the blood of Christ, the gift that he has given, abounds more. It's greater than all of the sin that people have committed. It's beyond all of that. Well, one person might say, well, if that's the case, we can continue in sin so that grace can continue to abound. And Paul said, no, that's not the point that you're supposed to get. In chapter 6, verse 2, certainly not. How shall it be? He answers that. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And that's the basis for the statement in verse 3 about baptism. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? He's essentially bringing up baptism. It's not that they don't know what baptism is. It's not because they need to know it's for salvation. They already know it's for salvation. He's bringing that up because baptism has a pointer in it that says you've died to sin. You're not supposed to commit sin, right? You've died to that. And as he continues there in verse 7 of chapter 6, he who has died has been freed, right, from sin. And we're not free just to do nothing. You've got to fill the vacuum with something. In verse 13, he says, Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to, uh, as instruments of, of unrighteousness to sin, Rather present yourselves to God alive from the dead and members in your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So the, the contrast is here, we were dead in sin. Now we're dead to sin. We were dead to righteousness. Now we're alive to righteousness, right? And so the faith that grants this boldness doesn't provide a license to sin. It doesn't provide arrogance. In Romans chapter 11, verses 17 through 22, Paul uses the metaphor of, a, uh, of an olive tree, and the natural branches represent the Jews, and the unnatural branches represent uh, the Gentiles. And I'm bringing this up because sometimes some people will abuse Romans chapter 7, <clears throat> Romans chapter 7, verse 6, which says, we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should... Uh, serve in the newness of the spirit, not the oldness of the letter. They're saying like, look, we're in the newness of the spirit. We're not the oldest of the letter. Away with the old, in with the bold. And so we can be free today. No, the, the book that says that in chapter 7 also gives a warning in chapter 11 that says, look, you can't boast against the branches in verse 18 of chapter 11. Do not boast 
He says, but if you do boast, remember, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Who's the root? In this olive branch where natural branches were cut away and unnatural branches or wild olive branches were grafted in, who supports the root? No one. Who supports the branches? The root. The branches don't support the root. Who's the root? Jesus is. You will say branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but what? Verse 20, do not be haughty, but fear. So the book that talks about serving God in the newness of letter, newness of the spirit, implements the service of fear. Service of fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches of the Jews who unbelief were taken away, by unbelief were taken away, he may not spare you either, right? The Gentiles who were grafted in. Therefore, consider the goodness and the severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward you goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And so this brings us to the issue that, you know, faith in Christ, it doesn't allow us to to sin, it doesn't allow arrogance. Our confidence is in the gospel. Our confidence is in the minist- administration of the new covenant. That's, that's the point of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. When you talk about the Old Testament, Moses put a veil on, and that veil covered his glory. And that glory of his face, eventually the glow of his face faded away. And he's saying that's reminiscent of the law itself. It will fade away. But we use great boldness of speech in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 12. Because of the hope that we have. And that hope is tied to verse 6 of being sufficient ministry of the new covenant. Not verse 5 of ourselves, but of the new covenant. That's where our hope and confidence comes in. And it's just that plain and that simple. And so sometimes we try as people, as broken man, we try to skirt the issue of sin. And we don't like sin, but we love sin. We don't like it but we love it. And so in order to love it and not like it, we have to justify how we can stay in it. And so we come up with these ridiculous notions that say, I know I can sin continually and be covered continually. So we'll have a continual cleansing theory that says, as I sin, the washer, like your windshield wipers, will wipe away the sin of your soul just as quick as you come in. Right? They don't stop to think about, nobody continually drives around with their windshield wipers on, do you? I hate it. I mean, when my wife is driving and it's not raining and the windshield wipers are on, I, can you please shut those off? Because I get irritated at dumb little things. But I don't see people just driving around with windshield wipers on continually. You have to flip it on, right? Turn it on, turn it off. It's conditional. They're using something that's not conditional to try to convey something that is And that annoys me. But let me tell you this. John says it's conditional. It's condition-based. If we confess our sins. He's talking to Christians. If we confess our sins, that's the condition. He is faithful and just to forgive our sins. What's What's the blessing? He will forgive. He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a great thing to think about. Every single shred of wickedness can be cleansed by Jesus Christ to the Christian who will confess his sin to God. That's powerful blood. This is why Paul said it abounds way beyond the transgression there in Romans chapter 5. It's way more powerful than the sins that we can commit. But we must confess it. And what does confession do? It makes me acknowledge it, right? Not skirt it. The continual cleansing garbage with the wiper, that says I don't have to acknowledge it and I can love it and stay in it even though I don't like it. No, it doesn't work that way. you got to confess it. And then there's the Christian that says, well, I don't believe it because you say it's a sin, but I don't really believe it is a sin. And that's the person here in verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. That's When you take the Bible and say, look, this behavior is sinful. Can't you see how it applies? And the like of Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 21, and you might run to this other place. No, it doesn't say it specifically. 
It's not sin. I'd repent if I was sinning. I've heard, I've heard that. I'd repent if it was a sin, but it's not a sin. And when you show them from Scripture, they say it's not a sin. You know what they're saying? They're saying God's a liar. That's what they're saying. So let's just translate it in bold English. You're saying God's a liar, right? We make him a liar. And number two, we also prove that God's word is not in us because God's word convicts us. So when we have sin in our lives, we need to deal with it. And that's the part of the lesson here that brings in application. For he who covers his sins will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. If I cover them, if I conceal them, I will not prosper. And so we have a scenario. I mean, you think about it. This brother gets involved in a sin. He gets found out by other brothers. These brothers, and this is not just fiction-based, okay? These other brothers come and they take him aside and say, look, this kind of behavior you're doing on social media is absolutely not right. It's not appropriate for a Christian. Well, he continues to do it. And uh, he, over a course of time, after he's being talked to, he and his family leave and they go and join another church. Another year later or whatever. I mean, he's, he's withdrawn from and then in the, in the uh, time that passes, he joins another church and confesses Jesus as Lord and is baptized. Is that how we deal with sin as Christians? We get mad at this church, jump to another church, then we confess Jesus as, as Christ, and then we're baptized? That's not how Jesus tells us to deal with our sins as Christians. That previous passage is telling us how to deal with our sins as Christians. So Jesus, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't say, when you sin, deny it, hop to another church, confess Jesus, and then be baptized, and you don't have to worry about those sins. That's not how Jesus says you deal with sin as a Christian. What does he say? He says you've got to deal with your sin. In the Sermon on the Mount... Matthew 5, 23, he said, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, that, that's worship, right? And you remember that your brother has something against you. There's a brother out there who has something against me. I've done something to him. He says, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, we're talking priorities. First, there's a lot of firsts in Scripture. It makes a great sermon. First. This is one of those first. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. First get it right here with your brother, then come and worship. What's he saying? Deal with your sin that you've done against your brother. Don't skirt the issue, just deal with it. And this is where James 5, 16 comes in. Confess your trespasses one to another or to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effect of fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You know, the Catholic Church has taken this and just abused it. They've created this confessional booth where one has a multitude of people confessing to one. That's not what this verse is teaching. It's not the church or the parish or all these people in this area confessing to one priest or one preacher or one elder. That's not the system here. Let's just keep it for what it is. We can all see what it is. Let's appreciate what it is not. It's not the Catholic confessional. There is no mortal that God has placed to become a mediator between him, between a sinner and God. God has not made mortals mediators to absolve sin. The only confessional that exists is found in Romans chapter 3, verse 24. And that is the mercy seat that Jesus is. He is our confessional. He is. He's our propitiation, literally the mercy seat there. Okay? It's not a man. It's not just a man. It's Jesus, the mediator, the one mediator. 
So what is this passage teaching? It's teaching us, although it's not directly addressing this idea of confessing our sins to God, this verse is not directly addressing that. Okay? We know that we confess our sins to God. We just talked about that in 1 John chapter 1. You can go to Acts chapter uh, 8 as well and pray to God. When Simon the sorcerer was rebuked there, pray to God. This passage here is not dealing with that. This passage is dealing with what? This passage is dealing with a mutual duty. See how mutual it is? To one another. Confess your what? Trespasses, your sins, to one another and pray for one another. One another, one another, one another. It's mutual, okay? Confess your trespasses to one another. It's not on the part of one, but to another, one another. It's occasional that you may be healed. I love that that's in here because it teaches me that it's occasional. Sin is occasional. It's not, it's not uh, something that's constant, okay? Just like sickness. We, meet, we need to be healed on the occasion when we're sick. We need health on the occasion when we're sick, right? That's what we need. So when I trespass, what do I need to do? I need to confess it. If I trespass against you, I need to confess it. And I need to pray, and you need to pray with me and for me so that I can be healed of the sin in which I'm a part of or have a part of. So it's mutual, it's occasional, and it's particular. It's not indiscriminately. It's confess your trespasses to one another as much as it is pray for one another. What does this look like? It looks like Matthew chapter 18 is what it looks like to me. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, Jesus gives some counsel on how to deal with sin in the church. And he tells us in verse 15, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. You know, this sin was there. It's a trespass. He sinned against him. Now, we know that all sin is against God, but we know here that there is a sin against this brother, and this brother is, is they're trying to work it out. And so if he hears you, you've gained him. That sin goes no broader than that than that compartment right there. That's it. That's as far as it goes. It doesn't, it doesn't go beyond that. It's right there. It's, it's over. Okay? It's those two, and it's God. Well, if he doesn't hear you, then uh, we read here in verse 16, if he will not hear you, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. If he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. Now it's a church matter. See how big it's getting? But if he refuses to even to hear the church, how would he hear the church? There would be some, the need of some kind of collective action against him, right? From the church, for him to be heard, to hear the church. And if he doesn't hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Why does Jesus say, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector? It is not because heathens and tax collectors are beyond redemption. It's not because that's the worst kind of sins ever. He's talking about a societal, cultural uh, treatment that these Jews had toward a tax collector or a heathen. That is, they avoided them. They avoided them, okay? They withdrew themselves from them. And that's what he's bringing in here. You need to, the way you treat a tax collector is how you need to treat this unrepentant disciple who will not hear any reason, okay? That's what he's saying there. So it's very particular, and it's very occasional. It's not some regulated, ongoing thing that takes place, and we got this booth over here, and if you got sins to come, you need to come and talk to me about it. That's not what's going on here in James chapter 5, verse 16. It's, I need to man up to my sin, and when I... When I say or do something against you, I need to confess that to you, okay? 
and you need to confess that to me if you do it to me. And that's what James is saying, and it's a very simple solution, and it solves the demands of love in the family of God. It, it makes us closer when we own our wrong, and we confess that and ask for one to forgive us. It should make us closer. It's, it's instruction that's beautifully execu executed here, and the quarrels and the divisions are mended, and the problems are solved simply by doing what the Lord has told us to do. Well, what happens if it's scandalous sin? If, what do we do? Let me ask you this. How public are scandalous sins? Very public, right? Very public. Let me ask you another question. Is it possible for a good person to commit a scandalous sin? Yes, it is. That still has to be dealt with, right? So a good person can commit a scandalous sin. David was a good person and he committed a scandalous crime that involved adultery, a cover-up, as well as murder, okay? He tried to keep it a secret, but it became known. The nations knew it. The nations were given ammunition now to blaspheme the name of Jehovah, 2 Samuel 12, 13 and 14. He tried to cover it up. He didn't want to confess it. He kicked against it. This he writes about in Psalm 32. Uh, in Psalm 32, we have, Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven. By the way, this psalm is referenced in the book of Romans. Okay? David would not be forgiven through the law of Moses. The law of Moses requires David to be put to death. Okay? But the grace of God pardon David from death. Nathan said, you shall not die. That's what the legal law said you should do. You should die. You should be stoned for what you've done. David now, and Paul is using David in Romans, this very verse is quoted there. Blessed is, is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity or charge iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. That was David's spirit. It was full of deceit at one time. He says, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. Day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. And he pauses there, Selah. That means pause. That's kind of like pause and restraint. He's just pausing and thinking about it. That's what he's telling us to do. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity. My iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And he puts another pause right there. I confessed it, and you forgave The law of Moses didn't forgive it. God forgave it. God forgave it through faith, you see. Confession is an act of faith. And he was, he was, he was justified through faith that way, just like we are justified through faith when we do what Jesus tells us to do. So scandal was committed. David tried to cover it up, but once he confessed... He was forgiven. As he covered it up, the heavy hand of God was on him, and he felt it even physically in his bones, in his, in his stature. He felt the aging effects of sin in the conscience. So when a Christian sins affects the church or is known by the church, what do you think he should do? If he will not hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. This would involve what when he wants to hear the church? it would involve a public confession, wouldn't it? It would involve an acknowledgement of some sort to the church. Think of it. How can the church, uh, why would the, what would the church, what is the church supposed to do who has disciplined this person and now you treat them like a heathen or a tax collector and the person says, I repent, but nobody knows it. He repents, but he doesn't tell anybody. You've got to, you've got to convey that. And you've got to convey it because the church has a duty also that doesn't just go with withdrawal or discipline. It has the duty of, of conveying love and forgiveness and comfort. Second Corinthians chapter 2, we read in verse 7, on the contrary, you ought to rather forgive and comfort him. Who? The man in 1 Corinthians 5. 
the fornicator. That was a scandal. It was well known. He says, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up in too much sorrow. You need to reaffirm, he says, your love to him in verse 8. Well, how can the church know to do that if they don't know the person has repented? So communication. That's what confession is. It's communicating. It's just that simple. Communicate your trespasses to one another. We should have the humility to do that. That's what the Bible teaches. So there's boldness in the gospel, but there's not brash. Okay? There's bashfulness, not brash. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain help, mercy, and find grace, help in time of need. That's boldly we can approach his throne. We have in Hebrews chapter 10, 19, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiness by the blood of Jesus, where we can be confident in going to heaven because of the blood of Jesus. And he talks about how we can encourage and hold on to our faith and, 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 and stay true to, to the Lord and, and that confession. But then we understand in Hebrews 12, there's still that bashfulness with reverence and godly fear. This is boldness without bashfulness. When a person forsakes the assembling of the saints to where it becomes a habit, a manner that is described here as is the habit of some, what happens? He says in verse 26, if we sin willfully, there's that habitual, unrepentant sinner. After we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Being bold in sin nullifies the blood of Jesus Christ. So, Thinking about these things, where sustaining a sense of shame will take a person. Luke chapter 18, Jesus speaks of two different people who goes to the temple, and the first man he talks about prays what? The Pharisee stood up and did what? What did he pray? He prayed this, but who's he praying to? He prayed thus with himself. Why is he praying with himself? Because he trusts in himself, that he's righteous, and he despises other people. And so his prayers don't go any higher than the roof or the ceiling. And so here he is praying with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. And then he says here, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Who's he idolizing? Who's he worshiping? Himself. Himself is his God, and he's praying to himself, and he's putting himself on his own pedestal. Trump, his own, he's beating the the drum of his own... Sounding the sound of his own horn. And the tax collector, on the other hand, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Is he bashful? Is he shamefaced? Yes. Well, what does it bring him? I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Justification comes through being shamefaced. When Nehemiah was talking about Israel, he said, he, you know, God testified against them that that they might bring them back to your law, and yet they acted proudly and did not heed your commandments, but sinned against your judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. And they shrugged their shoulders and stiffened their necks and would not hear. Look at the posture. Look at the physical gestures that are coming here. Shrugging the shoulders, right? Stiffening their necks, closing their ears. What did that get them? That's bold. But it's not shame facing. It's not humble. It's not godly fear. They would not hear. They would not heed. Well, we got to have it. It's a part of it. We got to sustain it as we move forward. Always checking in the mirror. Examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith, Paul told the Corinthians. We need to have that spirit of fear move within our own bones as well. As with every night, we want to end with an opportunity to come to Christ. Maybe you're a Christian and you've sinned. There's an invitation for you to confess your sins. If there's someone that you've sinned against, you know, go first to, to that person. If someone holds it ill against you, you've got something against you, go to that person first. Maybe there's something you've done on a public nature that needs to be uh, confessed. Maybe you're not a Christian. If you're not a Christian, think of the example of Lydia. She was saved with reverence and godly fear. Now, a certain woman named Lydia, right? certain woman named Lydia heard us. I underscore that. Lydia what? Lydia heard. 
She was a seller of purple from the city of Tyra who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart. Sometimes people jump on this. Operation of the Holy Spirit, direct operation of God. He opened her heart. No, she first what? Lydia heard us. Then we read the Lord opened her heart. That is simply that the Lord opened her heart when she was hearing the gospel. God was opening her heart. That's how God opens our heart is when we hear his word. And when she and her whole household were baptized, she begged, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Ask this question, just like the others. Why was Lydia baptized? The same reason that those on Pentecost were, the same reason the chief of sinners was. But you know what? We have an answer right here. She can't be faithful to the Lord without it. Had she not been baptized, could she say, if you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord? She wouldn't have been considered faithful. Neither will you. It's good enough for her. It's good enough for you. It's good enough for a woman selling purple from Thyatira who hears the gospel. It's good enough for you. If it can save Paul, the chief of sinners, it's good enough for you. If it can save those on the day of Pentecost, it's good enough for you. So if you're subject to the invitation, why not come? As together we stand and as we sing.